This is episode 3 of Amos chapter 1, part 2, or B. So Amos is over here. This is the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Judah. Here's Amos preaching to the north, to Israel. And he quotes Joel, so he lived after Joel. And Amos was active between circa 760 to 753, just seven years active as a preacher, during the reign of King Hosiah of Judah and Jeroboam II of Israel. And the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. So here's Jeroboam II reigning, and here's Isaiah reigning, and the two of them overlapped. This is not a picture to scale. So this is a recap of chapter 1a, and you can pause now and read all this. Or you can just continue. Continuing. The layout of Amos illustrates his key idea, judgment comes. A primary biblical principle is our holy God judges sin. A second biblical principle is God will stay his judgment if we truly repent and change our ways. So chapter 1 is a judgment on Israel's neighbors. So 1a, I did Damascus, Gaza, and Tyre, Syria, Philistines, and Phoenicia. This is modern Syria, modern Lebanon, and Gaza. And now in 1b, we're going to be doing the neighbors, which is Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So worship must be on God's terms, not ours, according to crosswork.com. The people of Israel, like their siblings to the south, were called to return to God, and that meant true and correct worship, not just pagan stuff mixed in, which had not been done for quite some time. True worshippers will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and always on God's terms, never their own. Anything else amounts to idolatry. In John 4, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, But the hour is coming and now is. When the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. And God is sovereign over all the nations. So the focus of Amos' ministry is the nation of Israel, yet the first two chapters of Amos include charges against surrounding nations and the enemies of Israel. Why does this matter? Because although these nations had not entered into a covenant relationship with Yahweh, they would still be held responsible for their crimes against humanity and mistreatment of God's people. Evil does not go unnoticed by the King of Kings. Furthermore, God will always hold his chosen people to the highest standard since they've been given the truth and called to be a blessing to the nations. God is sovereign over all nations. So chapter 1a, Amos prophesied to the three Arab nations that are the enemies of Israel, unrelated by blood. Now in chapter 1b, Amos tackles the enemies of Israel that are their cousins of their own bloodline. And so we have uh, Ammon, Moab, and Edom on the eastern border, Transjordan. So let's see how they are cousins. So here's Abraham's family tree. So here's Abraham's father, Terah, and he had... Abraham, he had Sarah, who actually Abraham married. It was his half-sister, same dad, different mother, Nahor and Haran. And Haran, so Abraham and Haran are brothers, and Haran has a son called Lot. So uh, you remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, um, and Lot and his two daughters ran up into the mountains, and they thought they were the only ones left alive, and so they got their dad drunk and slept with him. And the youngest daughter gave birth to Ammon, and the oldest daughter gave birth to Moab, and they became the father of these two tribes, the kingdom of Ammon and the kingdom of Moab. So they were cousins through the fact that Abraham and their father, their grandfather, Haran, were brothers. Now Abraham's seed, he had Isaac, and with Rebekah, they had the twins Esau and Jacob. And Esau didn't uh, value his birthright, so he gave it to Jacob, sold it to Jacob for a pot of soup. And then in rebellion, he married an Egyptian woman, and he is then the father, became the father of the Edomites, whereas Jacob stayed within the anointed line, God's anointed line, married Rachel, a Jewess or Hebrew, and gave, and between the two of them, they, the three of them actually, Leah, the ugly sister, 
they uh, had the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's how come Ammon, Moab are cousins of Israel and Edom as well is cousins of Israel, or bloodline at least. So let's dive into chapter 1b, Woe to Israel's Cousins. Notice that since Amos is prophesying doom on the north neighbors, so the people are still happy to listen to him. Now Amos tackles the enemies of Israel that are their cousins, or at least of their own bloodline. Amos is called the prophet of doom, because he doesn't have any fluff in his book. He just gets right down to it. There's no skirting the issues facing the northern kingdom. Chapter 1, verse 11, Judgment on Edom. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away from its punishment because he pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So here's Edom and this little red line that they put in here is actually the traveling of Moses when uh, he and the Israelites left Egypt. They traveled down the Sinai Peninsula and eventually they got to Kadesh Barnea here where Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land, into Canaan. And they came back and they said, uh, no, these are big giants. And so they wouldn't go to fight. And so God had them wandering around the desert here for 40 years. But eventually God said, okay, you can move on now. And when they wanted to traverse Edom, the kingdom of Edom, the Edomites said no. In fact, they sent out an army to stop them. So Moses had to take his people all the way down here. And all the way around Edom. So it added hundreds of days. And God, God, of course, was having to provide for them all this way around until here. And then they fought under Moses. They fought the Moabites and the Ammonites. This Ammon has got a double M today. So, this, so God was so angry with Edom that he didn't let Moses just cut across the top of his kingdom. That he said, I will take you out. And he did. So he pursued his brother with the sword because he sent an army to stop Moses and force them to do the long way around. Now judgment is on nations on Israel's eastern border. So it's, now it's the east. So they've done way away and they've done the western border of Lebanon and Gaza and now God is focusing on the eastern border. So recall that in history the stories of the twin Jacob and Esau where Esau was the firstborn and thus inherited the birthright. However, Esau had contempt for his inheritance and sold his birthright to Jacob for a measly pot of soup. The birthright and the blessing are one and the same. If you had the one, you got the other. So Jacob got Isaac's blessing, albeit subterfuge was involved. Later, after wrestling with an angel all night, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Because Jacob really did honor God and wanted to follow God's will all the time. So while Jacob obediently married within the Hebrew clan, Esau deliberately married an Egyptian to offend his parents, and his offspring are the Edomites. God's intention was that they be brothers, not enemies. Yet there was perpetual bad blood and open hostilities between the twins that lasted for centuries until the Edomites were finally wiped out. And he kept his wrath forever. The Edomites committed their worst crime when they betrayed Judah during the Babylonian conquest and did not come to their aid. Instead, they watched the Babylonians attacking Jerusalem and cheered them on. They even stood at the crossroads, blocking any escape. God was angry enough then to say that the Edomite nation would be obliterated because they kept up their demonic hatred forever. Probably stood up here on the mountains cheering them on. There is no nation of Edom today. Not at all. The last of the Edomites were King Herod and his sons. These kings of Israel were Edomites, not Jews. And that's why they were so hated in Jesus' time. Because they were Edomites. Herod bought his crown from the Romans when Jesus was born as a real, true king of the Jews. And that's why Herod was scared of him. Because the, the wise men said, oh, the king of the Jews has been born. And Herod had bought his crown. So God just likes family members to be at loggerheads. Brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, aunts and uncles. Jesus clarifies this for us. Forgiveness is paramount. Matthew 18, Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Matthew 18, Jesus said, Oh, I should have done this in red like that. 
Sorry about that. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. In other words, if you don't forgive, why do you expect God to forgive you? But I will send a fire upon Timon, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Notice that God's judgment is always just fire, 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 fire. Right? Gave them all, and now he's added Timon in chapter 1. So Edom has two major cities. Timon and Bosra. Timon was the southernmost key city of Edom and is named after the grandson of Esau, that Esau, the twin of Jacob who had contempt for the purposes and will of God, that Esau. After the Israelites conquered Canaan, which was this area here, this whole area, um, Joshua divided up the land and gave Judah the land up to the borders of Edom. So you see, when Joshua divided the land, God still, here's Judah and here's Edom. So God still um, at that time, respected the borders of Edom, um, and Judah was given everything up to its borders. They didn't encroach on the territory. 200 years later, King Saul was still fighting the Edomites until finally King David conquered them. Devour the palaces of Bosra. Bosra was the northernmost, second major city of Edom, was famed for their dyed garments. It was just south below Selah, the capital of Edom. So this is the kingdom of Edom, and up here, way up here was Selah, their capital, and just below it was Bosra. So it was the northernmost city. And then way down here, which people today think is Petra, was uh, Timon. So uh, this was the southernmost city. So between the northern city, it basically encompassed the kingdom of Edom, is what they're saying here. So uh, the judgment against Edom is mentioned in more Old Testament books than against any other foreign nation, because he was a twin. I mean, these were the daughters of, of a grandpa, but these, Jacob and Esau were twins. So it's mentioned in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Joel, Obadiah, Malachi, and Amos. In fact, the book of Obadiah is dedicated to the destruction of Edom. With the destruction of these two major cities and everything in between, Edom lost its capacity for continual warfare. But they infiltrated, they infiltrated. So I want to show you this so that you can understand why Lot's daughters slept with dad. So this is the plains of Moab. If you look it up in Google, it gives you this picture, the plains of Moab. And if you, if you, if you, and this is the mountains here. So if you good with topography, this is the mountain range here and the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. And this huge valley here is the plain, plains of Moab. And here's Jericho and another set of mountains and then the valley of, of making up Israel. Well, all of this is Israel. They were running. And so let's say somewhere around here is Sodom and some places Gomorrah and maybe a few little communities here and there. But when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like. I mean, these, this Punishment was raining down on this valley. So here's Lot's wife, here's Lot and his two daughters and his wife, and the catastrophe raining down on this valley. So when the daughters woke up the next day and looked down on this devastated valley with millions of livestock, cattle, goats, sheep, all fried and just burnt to a crisp, any little community burnt to a crisp, any little rural community, Sodom and Gomorrah existing no more. You can see why they would think, good grief, you're the only ones left alive. And so they slept with their father. Now, interestingly, here's um, Lot's wife. We all know the story. She turned around and turned to a pillar of salt. And I read this, uh, uh, this, this minister once was saying that in the Bible, when they said back in the day, they turned back, because we understand she turned back to look and then turned into a pillar of salt. And he said, it, it, back in the day, turn back meant you went back. So she's running along behind Lot and, and the kids. And then she remembers, oh my gosh, my jewelry's back there. My favorite scarf is there. I've got my favorite couch. And so she turned back. She actually walked back or ran back towards Sodom to try and rescue her favorite things and got caught up in the maelstrom. So that's what that one uh, person interpreted turned back to me, which I thought was interesting. Okay, judgment on Ammon. So verse 13, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away as punishment because they ripped open the woman with child in Gilead 
that they might enlarge their territory. So they did that just to gain territory. The people of Ammon. So Ammon's very close to Israel, just over the Jordan border, uh, Jordan River, here it is here, on the east, their eastern border. The Ammonites are the descendants of the youngest of Lot's two daughters. When after the destruction of Sodom, the two thought that no one was left alive, so they got their father drunk and slept with them. The youngest daughter gave birth to the father of the Ammonites, who were cousins to the Hebrews through the line of Abraham's brother Haran. And the Edomites, they ripped open the women with child in Gilead. So this was a brutal genocide carried out by the Ammonites. When the Ammonites overran a country, they ripped open all the pregnant women so that there would be no more immediate future generation of those people. 325 years earlier, the Ammonites, to enlarge their borders, presented a claim on Gilead, today's Golan Heights. So it's up here. Here's Gilead, so it's up here. Which they said belonged to them before Israel entered the land. When Moses led his people up the east coast, because he couldn't go to Eden, he had to go all the way around, and he led them up the east coast. Um, on the east side of the river Jordan, the Ammonites came out to do battle with them. And with God's help, the Israelites overran the Ammonites and occupied the land. And now 300 plus years later, the Ammonites want the land back. But Jephthah, the Gileadite, commander of the Israelite army, said that in the preceding 300 years, the Ammonites had not tried to recover the land, therefore he refused the request. So a particularly brutal war ensued and the Ammonites were again defeated. About 50 years later, the Ammonites once again attacked Jabesh Gilead and this time Gilead offered to make peace with the Ammonites because of this particularly brutal war. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, arrogantly answered them, on this condition I will make a covenant with you that thou may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on Israel. This was a highly offensive offer to the Hebrews and to anyone. So instead, King Saul rounded up all the tribes of Israel and went to war against the Ammonites and won. Clearly, the Ammonites were an unspeakably brutal people, ripping open pregnant women and blinding enemy warriors just to expand their territory. And God says, for this barbaric atrocity, it's time for them to be gone. Verse 14, but I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabah, and it shall devour its palaces. Amid shouting in the day of battle, and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, I will kindle a fire. So he's already done it five times, four times before, he's going to do it again. This prophecy was fulfilled through the Assyrians. The wall of Rabah, the wall of Rabah. Rabah is the capital city of the Ammonites. And today it's called Ammon. The prophet Zephaniah prophesied the total destruction of the region. Zephaniah 2 said, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Amorah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnants of my people shall possess them. So today, the fertile abundance of Israel is such that they export their harvest to neighboring Arab countries. Transjordan, on the other hand, is mostly desert. Only a tiny fraction of Jordan's land is arable, and the country imports foodstuffs to meet its needs. They are a perpetual desolation. Look at that compared. Verse 15. Their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, says the Lord. Their king shall go into captivity. Jeremiah 49, cry, you daughters of Rabah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, lament and run to and fro by the walls, for Milcom shall go into captivity with his priests and his princes together. So Milcom means their king, their king shall go into captivity, and was connected to bull imagery. He was either the national god, or a popular god of the Ammonites, or a patron god of the Ammonite royal household. The name Milcom occurs three times, in each case in a list of foreign deities, who worship is offensive, whose worship is offensive to Yahweh, the one true God. And we have, Wall Street has its very own foreign deity, the bull. And what do they worship? They worship money, the love of money. 
And it's what? It's an offense to the one true God. So the bull God is mentioned in 1 Kings as Milcom, the detestation of the Ammonites, and Milcom, the God of the children of Ammon, and as Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon. It's a detestation and an abomination, and it's offensive to the one true God. But we have our very own bull God ourselves. So that's the end of chapter 1. But because these two, uh, Moab is now uh, part of this eastern, Ammon, Moab, and Aram, are three together, I've included it in, in this chapter 1b. So it's actually chapter 2, the first three verses. Judgment on Moab, Transjordan. Verse 1, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. Transgressions of Moab. So after the destruction of Sodom, Lot's oldest daughter slept with her father, giving birth to the father of the Moabites. That was the oldest daughter. So they were the cousins to the Hebrews through the line of Abraham's brother. So 90 years earlier, Moab was a vassal state of Israel. So Israel com controlled Moab. Mesha, king of Mo Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid Ahab, king of Israel, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when King Ahab of Israel died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And when Moab rebelled, Israel attacked. In desperation, the king of Moab sacrificed his eldest son and heir on a high wall to his god, Shemosh, the Moabite national deity. So Ammon had the bull and Moab had Shemosh. The act so sickened everyone that the war was abandoned. Wow. And you know, the silly thing is that the king, the king of Moab probably thought that, that, they, that his false god Shemosh had released him from war instead of just saying that the Israelites were so sickened by this act. Because he burned the bones. Moab's major transgression was the result of a long burning feud between Moab and Edom. And he burned the bones. Moab's major transgression was the result of a long burning feud, funny word that, between Moab and Edom. Basically, Lot's descendants fighting Esau's kids. So out of vindictive spite and anger, the Moabite king dug up the bones of a long dead Edomite king and threw them into a fire. The reverence with which in ancient times the tomb was regarded is well known. Yet the Moabites treated the bones with an unnecessary and shocking indignity. God noticed the sacrilege of burning the bones, even of an enemy, and promised to avenge this disgraceful injustice. Deuteronomy 32, vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. Even today, people will desecrate a Jewish tomb if they can. Look at this picture from the UK Times of a hundred graves desecrated at a Jewish cemetery. Isn't that unbelievable? A hundred graves. Verse 2. And that's today. Verse 2. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kiriath. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound. The palaces of Kiriath. Archaeologists believe Kiriath was the capital city of Moab. I will send a fire upon Moab. So the Moabites were into burning, his son on a high wall and the bones of the dead. So God sends them fire on them. This is the sixth nation and all six enemies of Israel got the destruction of fire from God. So yes, Kiriath, Moab. Now we're in chapter 2. These were all in chapter 1. Send a fire upon Moab. So the, this prophecy of a fire on Kiriath was fulfilled by the northern kingdom. Verse 3. And I will cut off the judge from its midst and slay all its princes with him, says the Lord. When Jesus comes back, he will wipe out these seven nations mentioned in Ezekiel, which includes the six we just went through. They are very diverse nations, but they have one thing in common. They are all Muslims. David Parsons said, none of these nations are the people of God. None of them. None of those and none of the six we've just done. 
Therefore, none of them know the Ten Commandments or the Old Testament Scriptures. None of them know the one true God as he revealed himself to Israel. Yet all these nations are going to be judged by the God of Israel. So it doesn't matter if you don't believe in, in our God, in the God of Israel. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist and you don't believe in any God. You will be judged by the God of Israel. And God will not judge them according to Old Testament scriptures, since they've never known them. He will judge them according to the common laws of humanity, natural law. Romans 2 says, For as many as have sinned without Moses' law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So if you didn't know the law, there's no excuse you are going to still be judged, except by natural law. And we all know instinctively what natural law is. You just have to watch this. I saw this little video of this little three-year-old boy. And his face is covered in chocolate. His hands are covered in chocolate. He's got chocolate down the front of his shirt. And his father says to him, did you eat the chocolate cake? And he knows by natural law he's going to be judged, which is probably a paddling on his little butt. So he stands there and he lies. He says, no, uh uh-uh. Big, he opens his eyes wide so he looks as innocent as possible. And his father goes on and on. Are you sure you didn't eat the cake? No, no, I didn't. Even the dog has, looks guilty and sneaks into a corner. This kid stood there. And he refused it, but he'd eaten the chocolate cake even though his crime was all over him. But he knew he would be judged. And so he was not going to admit that. So whether you know the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament Scriptures, irrelevant. Whether you agree that there's a God or not is irrelevant. You will be judged one way or the other. So we are all hard-coded to instinctively know what is right or wrong, what is human or inhumane. Every man on earth knows this. Everyone understands what humanity is, even apart from the Bible. Our universal human rights are not accorded to us by any government, but given to us as our birthright by God. We have the right to be free. Therefore, slavery is wrong. And the worst kind was, of course, when uh, Joseph's brothers sold him to to Egyptian slave traders. And, you know, they thought they were, um, they knew they were doing wrong. They knew the law of Moses, and yet they sold Joseph into slavery. And so what they did for bad, God did for good and turned him into second in command of, of, of the land of Egypt. He stored up all the grain in the seven years of plenty and then gave it out in the seven years of famine, including to his family of 70 people at that point, uh, wives and children, and saved all of their lives, even though they tried to take his. So we have the right to be free. Therefore, slavery is wrong. But God usually will find a way to turn wrong into right. So God judges nations because they have been inhuman. Besides individual, he will judge a nation. They have committed barbaric atrocities on their own kind. Everybody in God's creation stands before the God of Israel and his judgment. Everybody, whether you believe it or not, in God or not, is irrelevant. Everybody stands before God. These six nations in Amos all violated God's morality. Not one of these six nations exists on the face of the earth today. Not one. Other peoples have migrated to their lands, but the original inhabitants no longer exist. Any nation guilty of inhumane acts forfeits its right to live on God's green earth, which is why I'm so afraid for America. And there's a large remnant in America praying daily on our knees that God will not take out his punishment on the nation of America because of our inhumane acts and then we forfeit our right and none of these nations exist today and I don't want that for America. Yet we have all violated God's greatest commandments, all of us. Matthew 22, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the whole Bible basically boils down, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So, And all humanity is commanded. These are two commandments, to love God and to love our fellow man. When Jesus says love thy neighbor, intuitively we all understand what that means. It fundamentally encompasses loyalty, allegiance, faithfulness, concern and caring, 
distrust, affection, and romance resulting between biological males and females. It's ludicrous that now we have to spell this out, biological males and females, and pass laws to enforce these definitions. After all, just two genders existed for the last 6,000 years and we never questioned it. Such is the counterfeit of the New World Order lies. So here, if you look at this, you don't have to guess which is the boy and which is the girl. And this, I thought, was the cutest thing one day I saw a meme where a little boy is looking at a little girl and he says to her, Oh, you must be a little girl because you're wearing pink. And seriously, at that age, that's all they need to know about genders. That he needs to know he's a little boy in blue, she's a little girl in, green, in pink. That's all they need to know at that age. In fact, all the way up into the young teens, that's all they need to know about boys and girls. They don't need to learn the horrors and filth that they're teaching them in school today. They don't need to know that. That's all they need to know. Oh, you must be a little girl. You're wearing pink. So this is the end of episode 2, chapter 1b, Israel's cousins are judged. So we co covered the enemies in uh, chapter 1 in, in 1a, we covered the cousins in 1b, and the next episode we will cover Judah and Israel themselves. So having dealt with the neighboring Gentile nations, Amos now turns to Judah and Israel. And of course they're horrified when they discovered that they're being judged along with their enemies. God judges us by our thoughts and deeds, not by what others say about us. That's so valuable today because the, the, the mainstream media will tell you how wonderful everybody is, but underneath they are just rotten. God judges us by our thoughts and deeds, not by what others say about us. God is judge of the entire planet. Whether you believe it or not, you will be judged by the God of Israel. Always remember that Jesus loves you. So before we go on to episode 3, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Give you peace. Peace, peace. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom. <laughs>